Hello and welcome back to My Safety Hub. For the next two days, we will be covering the SIOSH Health and Safety Conference here at Gallagher Estate. Enjoy the information we're about to share with you, so come along for the ride. Hello and welcome to My Safety Hub. I'm Orchid Free, and today we are at the Gallagher Convention Center for the SIOSH Health and Safety Conference. Where it's an exciting time for us for these next two days. We will be covering a range of topics with speakers that will be discussing occupational hygiene, incident investigation and others as well. We'll be interviewing a range of people just to get their take on what the expectations are for the conference and actually we'll be discussing some of the topics that have been covered as well. Because for compensation fund, the prevention side of this work is very important. The more successful we are in the prevention, the less um, money we pay towards uh, you know, the people who are injured at, at work. We are here with the Director General, Mr. Tobile Lamati. Thank you, Mr. Lamati, for your time this morning. Uh, just a few questions on the presentation you did for us. Uh, first of all, how would you describe the current state of occupational health and safety in South Africa? Um, look, it's, it's, it's a, I can say it's a mixed bag of um, good and bad. Uh, good in the sense that you, you have um, strong activists, you have strong professionals in the occupational health and safety field. Mm -hmm. So you have um, you know, structures that support the work that the Department of Employment and Labor is doing. However, the reality is that um, you know, incidents and accidents is um, are also in, are also on the increase, mm. and we see that through the the the, the um, benefits that the, the compensation fund is paying is uh, is paying out. So, um, if you judge it just based on the number of incidents that are taking place, the status is bad. With this being said, and the promulgation for the amendment bill to be decided or be to released, um, when can we expect this promulgation process to be completed? We, our intention is to, make, is to ensure that before the end of this uh, financial year, which means that uh, before the end of 31st of March uh, 2024, mm -hmm. um, we, we want the bill to have been signed off by the President. So we, we're working hard to make sure that that happens, yeah. Chosen the topic, it's slightly controversial and I've been diplomatic, I've called it the questionable uh, constitutional, constitutionality of DEL investigations. Uh, we're here with Reynard Luch. Thank you, Reynard, for, for having us today. Um, just a few questions with regards to the topics that you covered uh, in, in the presentation. Uh, the first of which, on the matter of the health and safety practitioners not being provided with statutory duties currently, uh, what would be the benefits of such statutory duties being placed on health and safety providers or practitioners? I think most importantly, if you, if you uh, provide safety practitioners with statutory duties, um, uh, you'll find because sometimes they have difficulties with employers, you know, they become a nuisance. You must do this, you must do that, and you know, the emphasis is often on, on, on production and, and so on. So obviously it'll give them more clout, having a statutory duty, because if they don't comply with that duty, they're in trouble, and if the employer doesn't give them the resources to comply with those duties, they'll be in trouble. And you can look at the Mine Health and Safety Act, where you have provision for safety officers, as they call called. And they must be generally just competent people. Do you foresee any challenges in this regard from an employer's perspective, where such duties may be imposed on uh, health and safety practitioners or providers, but from an employer's perspective, where they may be start uh, to do or maybe start kicking against such requirements, or that maybe the practitioners themselves may be alienated from providing services? I doubt it because you know if you look at the Mine Health and Safety Act, it's, it's worked pretty well, and you know that's the 1996 sort of post constitution constitutional OHS legislation. I think most safety practitioners are actually, with our statutory duties, performing some of the functions we would envisage them to have uh, in terms of the statutes. It just means they will have more clout, I think, at the end of the day. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, what are the employers to do with regards to these inspector reports that are not being made available currently? Um, so, so what are their options in taking action to maybe get involved in gaining these reports? Well, they've resisted it, and uh, sadly I didn't get to the slide that I wanted to where the um, a, a North Gauteng High Court judge said it's unlawful and unconstitutional not to provide um, interested parties with uh, a copy of the report. And then, of course, you have the right to appeal any report which is an administrative action in terms of, of the promotion of Administrative Justice Act, but how can you appeal something you don't know? And you saw the dilemma I posed when you get a summons, uh, an employer for example from the NPA, and they hadn't seen the report before the summons is issued, so there's no provision to appeal, to make representations, and etc. And then to have a case withdrawn means a court appearance once the summons is issued. For those of you that don't know, there's a huge problem in the country. We, we, we're not going to get into the details of why and how, but essentially the RTMC is the custodian of the accident reports and the statistics. So whether it's an accident report compiled on your site because one of your vehicles reversed into a pole or whether it's a fatal crash, there's a process that you're supposed to go through in completing an accident report. Okay. So the national data is a problem. You can't get access to detailed data. Okay. Yes, I thoroughly enjoyed the, the performance. Thank you very much for that. Uh, can you tell me where Mr. Z began? Oh yeah, basically um, Mr. Z started in 2015, if I'm not mistaken. That time I was working for Stefanuti Stocks. So they are the ones who trained me actually to become a, a trained and qualified health and safety officer. Then after that I worked for them for about two years. That's where I got the mining experience as well as the construction experience. Then after that, I decided to, to form this Mr. Z Industrial Theatre because I have a background of acting as well, you know what I'm saying? Even though I'm not trained, but, you know, I got it from the township, you know, when we were growing up, attending these um, cultural groups, you know, that's when I began the love for, for acting. You know, so I had an opportunity, like I said, you know, to work with Stefanuti, you know, then they developed me to become a health and safety officer. Then I realized, you know what, let me match this thing together and start a company because I have passion for acting. I also have passion for safety, you know. So, yeah, so these things are together now, you know, we're moving forward with Mr. Z Industrial Theatre. We also need to make sure that there is a drive towards a more equitable and inclusive workplace so that everybody has the opportunity to shape their workplace but also to help for the public and employees to hold their employers to account. And then it was mentioned yesterday, the ILO in 2020 gave the Austrian professionals that the biggest mandate they've ever had, it's so exciting. It's a fundamental principle and right of work, a safe and healthy workplace. Now if that doesn't get you excited about going to work and making a difference, then I don't know what will. That is a global mandate to make the world of work better, which is like super exciting. So what's really nice about that is it aligns to IOSH's vision, um, which is really simple and it's short so I can remember it. A safe and healthy world of work for everyone. What are your views on the challenges that we face in South Africa with regards to health and safety? I think, I, I don't think they're particularly unique, um, but I think you've got a challenge of how you raise everybody's standard up. So, you know, what I've heard over the, over the last two days at the conference is, you know, an acknowledgement of some of those challenges with whether it be the competence of the inspectors that are out there or whether it's actually the understanding of OSH within, you know, the private sector, um, but also a, a real determination to identify those 
global standards and apply those to to South Africa. I think it's not you. It's not unique to have thriving businesses and also then people struggling. Um, I think we see that everywhere around the world, and it's one of the reasons we've come as IOSH to, you know, help spread some of the message that we can do to help members with their competence, um, to help them with their skills, and then ultimately to help them make improvements in the workplace. So that's alluding to my next question as well. Going forward, and if we look at the developments that we have, especially from a legislative point of view, uh, what role will uh, you guys play with regards to assisting us and working with SIOSH uh, in maybe getting to a point where uh, these challenges could be maybe pushed out of the way? Yeah, and I think it's, it's a great question, Ryan. So I think IOSH are here because, you know, one, we recognise that the SIOSH is, you know, a big community. Um, and I think we want to collaborate, you know, we want to help, uh, you know, raise the standards of, of members, pass on our knowledge. You know, we've seen good opportunities to link, um, you know, the Department of Employment and Labour through to some of the organisations that we work with through the ILO, um, so, and through the Commonwealth so that we can help kind of transfer some of those standards and some of those um, policies and ultimately yeah that's the aim isn't it how do we eliminate some of these problems and that's the biggest challenge in the world of work um, you know I think if we can reduce them first of all we're in a better place and then we aim for elimination after that. For any kind of stoppages, authoritative stoppages, injuries, machine changes, management of change processes, you need to make sure that there's a business continuity and sustainability process for your own employees and your operational rhythm and your safety rhythm. Right, so that is 71 fatalities per year for six days per month. Right, so that number is extremely high. We always consider you know, health and safety struck by incident or um, you know, slips and overexertion for that matter. But majority of the fatalities, unfortunately, are occurring on the roads, right? So when we talk about 2022, uh, where we had 47 fatalities in the year, 21 of those were as a result of motor vehicle accidents. We don't want to talk about mental health because it's something that feels like a bit of a taboo, especially in our country, but everywhere, actually. So if we actually look at, for example, the statistics around it, they say one in eight people will suffer with a mental health disorder around the world. That's an underestimation because people don't come forward for diagnosis or for assistance. And how do we as a business, how do we within an industry create psychological safety and allow for our employees to come forward and say, I need help, if we're not willing to talk about it ourselves? Then someone will suffer with some kind of mental health disorder, about one in three in South Africans. If we're going to be specific about exactly which disorders, one in six South Africans will suffer with anxiety, depression or substance abuse. Those are our top three mental health disorders in South Africa. Hi and welcome back. We're here with uh, Dr. Sanjay Manu, the President of SIOSH and Chief Development Officer at FEM. Thank you for your time and thank you for speaking with us. Thank you, Akut. Uh, so just a few questions, if you don't mind. First of all, what role does FEM play with regards to the reduction of workplace-related incidents and accidents? So certainly from an FEM perspective, we're a quota insurer for the construction industry. And some of the initiatives we've uh, put out there, we have an FEM construction health and safety committee. Uh, we have uh, grant recipients as well, who we pay a, a monthly or an annual fee. And through them, we try to encourage and promote uh, health and safety uh, practices within the construction sector. Uh, so we take health and safety very seriously at FEM, right? So the loss of one life is one too many, and our aim is definitely to try and reduce the number of fatalities and serious accidents on, a, on an annual basis. We are here with Nicolette Fisser, uh, the Chief Wellness Coordinator at Reality Wellness Group. Thank you for a very interesting presentation, and it's really nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you too. If we look at mental health and the awareness of it in South Africa currently, how would you describe it? Mental health in South Africa is definitely a contentious one. <laughs> and I say contentious because people don't want to talk about it. I think there's a lot of cultural differences as well. We do have the issue that some cultures do not believe that it's something that affects them. Um, we have also gender differences and a number of different factors. And so if you look at mental health in South Africa, um, there are very specific mental health disorders that come through in the country based on the sort of existence that we live. So, for example, PTSD is actually a really high 
um, mental health issue that happens in South Africa, obviously because there's a lot that happens, um, you know, just from a realistic point of view. But what's interesting is that we're not willing to talk about it. So if someone goes through a hijacking on the way to work, do we give them the space to process that? Do we give them time off? Or, you know, what is the policies that go with it? So I think, I think it's a very important topic to talk about, but I don't think we talk about it enough. So just a few questions with regards to the conference uh, as a whole. Uh, how did you find the conference? Uh, do you think that it lived up to your expectations? Are you happy with everything? Yeah, um, to be honest, I was quite shocked um, of the context that was covered. Um, most of the topics is what I wanted to hear. It's, uh, you know, the uncertainties that we would have um, as an EHS professional, just to understand, you know, the dynamics, because you've got your Department of Labor and all the stakeholders that play part, they made things clear. Um, what I liked was that um, most of the presentations were intense and obviously some of the questions that were answered would be clear you know um, within um, the profession on its own um, there's a lot of uncertainties and I mean we're living in a vogue uh, type of world where there's a lot of changes that we're dealing with um, and like I said one of the um, interesting topics that is close to my heart um, other than health and safety it's wellness you know um, wellness is something that as much as it's, it's new, um, we need to make sure that we strongly give support also to the employees with regards to that. We are here with Gareth Norkia, the Membership and Communication Manager for SIOSH. Uh, Gareth, first of all, well done on an excellently organized uh, event. I think everybody that I've spoken with has thoroughly enjoyed it. I myself have also enjoyed the presentations. Uh, I think the information that, that people have imparted here is, is really, really important. Uh, so in that regard, well done. Thank you so much, Orchid. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's very kind of you. And yeah, lots of planning going into it, lots of hard work behind the scenes. But thank you for the compliments. We really appreciate it. Thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, so just a few questions. Um, and you spoke about planning now. But uh, how long has this event taken to plan and organize? Oh, I wish I could tell you it takes a couple of weeks, but that's not the case. Um, I would say it's a full six months of planning with the, the SIRS team behind the scenes. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a roller coaster ride, but I think at the end of the day, if you take the time and plan it properly, um, you, you end up with a great event. So yeah, it takes about six months of solid planning up until the day that we, we get here. Fantastic. Uh, what are the main objectives with hosting an event such as this? Look, I think it's important to keep our name out there, to stay relevant in the industry. Um, I think it's also important for our members to attend uh, annual flagship events like the SARS conference. Fantastic speakers, uh, educational CPD points, uh, SAR CPD points, we have SACPC and CPD points as well. So all in all, I think it's a great benefit for our members and non-members to, to come and join the conference, have a fantastic day and a half of presenters, uh, networking, mingling, talking to one another, um, especially now that we're out of the COVID days. I don't, even, I don't even want to mention it, but it feels great to be out of it. So yeah, networking and coming together like-minded people coming together and speaking and having a bit of fun as well in between. <laughs> so uh, for you personally, what has been the highlight of the event so far? Goodness, am I allowed to say everything? <laughs> Look, um, we, we obviously have uh, keynote speakers uh, over the two days, um, so I don't really want to single out any speakers because I think all our speakers are great. To be honest with you, I know it's going to sound cheesy, but it's, it's being with our members, non-members, being here, being present, networking. So. Yeah, the highlight is for me coming together and enjoying ourselves, earning some CPD points, uh, learning from one another, and yeah, doing it every year, the same, uh, the same procedure every year. It's, it's really important to, to obviously have sponsors that are like-minded, like you've uh, spoken about. Are there any sponsors that you would like to thank? Yes, of course. Uh, we, we wouldn't be able to do this event with our sponsors, so a, a huge thanks to our sponsors. Um, if I go through the list very quickly, our, our platinum sponsor is a long-standing sponsor of ours, is Dromex. Um, they are platinum sponsors. Um, if we look at our lead sponsor, which is IOSH in the UK, 
Uh, also, we have three gold sponsors, which is FEM, Uvex, and Weber Wenzel. Uh, we also have our dinner sponsor, which is the She Group, and then also our delegate bag sponsors. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen all the delegates with their bags, and that's the intra group as well. So, massive thanks for our sponsors. Uh, we, this wouldn't be possible without our sponsors, so we greatly appreciate their support year after year. Awesome. Um, last question. Uh, what advice would you provide to registered practitioners that are registered with SIOSH and those individuals that are health and safety practitioners but not registered with SIOSH out there? For those that are not registered with SIOSH, I can only urge you to become registered with us. It can only benefit you to become professionally registered with SIOSH, uh, to seek employment. Uh, clients, employers, they, they seek professional occupational health and safety practitioners, so it can only benefit you. Uh, those that are just up and coming in the industry, uh, 18, 19 year olds that's interested in this industry and want to come and join the party with us, we also have an ordinary membership category that requires no qualification, it requires no um, years of experience. It's just so that you can stay up to date, receive the SARSH newsletters, uh, industry updates, legal updates. So yeah, whether you have 20 years experience plus or you're just in the industry, it can only benefit you to become a member of SARSH and become professionally registered. So very much uh, get registered, get involved, engage, and, and get, get to learn and engage with others that, that know maybe a little bit more about uh, you know, the industry itself. Thank you very much again for a well-organized event. Um, I have to reiterate the fact that everybody that I've spoken with has thoroughly enjoyed it so far. So, so congratulations and all the best for next year. Yes. Thank you. The planning will start shortly. <laughs> Thanks, Orko. Okay. We are now joined by Nils Nordkir, the CEO of SIOSH. Nils, thank you very much for having us and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. It's an absolute pleasure. Uh, so just a few questions with regards to the conference itself and some of the information that was shared with us. Uh, first of all, uh, what has been the highlights of this conference for you? Yeah, that's difficult to uh, put a pinpoint on it. I would say everything was a highlight uh, and this is not just uh, tongue in cheek. Uh, the, the presenters were world class. Um, the international speakers that we had was excellent. I think the highlight was that we uh, uh, achieved our objective uh, and that was to um, get, the, get more knowledge and, and, and experience over to our members and, we, and I think we achieved, achieved that. So I would say the highlight was in fact the whole conference. Thanks. That's fantastic. I spoke to a few people and they certainly share the sentiment that the conference itself was a massive success. Um, a question that I've got is the collaboration between SIOSH, uh, the Department of Labor and Health and Safety Service Providers, is becoming more and more important as time goes by. How do you see the role of SIOSH in South Africa for the future? Well, first and foremost, uh, SIOSH is a SACWA recognized professional body. So um, like any other professional body, the, the number one uh, priority is to look after your members and to ensure that they're professional. Uh, as a SACWA recognized professional body, you're actually there to protect the public. So it will be uh, not a great move if we don't uh, cooperate with the likes of the Department of Employment and Labor, which we do. And that's why we invited them to the conference. And that's why they presented here. Mm -hmm. And that's why our members got an opportunity to actually directly pose questions to the likes of the Director General and the, and the newly appointed Chief Inspector. Also, our cooperation with service providers and uh, um, health and safety service providers, they all go hand in hand, notwithstanding the fact that we're actually a professional body for individuals. Most important, yeah. The uh, rise of incidents and accidents that was discussed on the first day of, of the conference is something that a few people were actually shocked about. Um, what do you feel is required to make a larger impact from a health and safety service provider or health and safety professional's perspective on the industry itself? Yeah, I think, I think you, you, the key word there was professional. Whether you're a safety provider or whether you're an individual uh, practitioner, um, and hence exactly the existence of SIOSH uh, to award a professional designation to a professional uh, with a professional uh, list of what the person is competent in doing. So just like an engineer wouldn't go and sell his services uh, without being a registered PRENG, uh, you should also not be selling your services either as a consultant or as a professional unless you are professionally registered and know what the limits of your professional uh, ability is. And that is, and that is exactly what in our professional designations is. So that brings me to my next question, and this is with regards to competence and you mentioned it earlier, uh, knowledge. Um, so what will the role be of SIOSH going forwards with regards to building on these two aspects for individuals in the country? 
Yeah, the, the, the role would be to, uh, to get the message out even more, though we've got uh, over 20,000 members already, but there are still practitioners out there that's, that, that uh, let me put it to you this way. So, so professional registration in the general field of health and safety is not compulsory. It's not a statutory requirement. So we have to place ourselves and market ourselves and uh, in the process convince clients that's going to use the, the profession to say, well, we cannot use them unless they are professionally registered. Uh, we have the classic case in the construction industry where the SACPCMP is the appointed counsel. Uh, that's statutory, whether you like it or not, whether the client likes it or not. So, But we're talking about general health and safety, other industries. Mm -hmm. And we have to get the mindset there that this is a professional profession and you have to be professionally registered. And there should be a professional body that monitor you and actually discipline you if you don't work to a code of conduct. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the role that SARS is playing and going forward, uh, hopefully more of that. I think the South African landscape in terms of health and safety is going to be interesting, especially over the next 18 months uh, with the possible promulgation of the amendment bill. Um, but in that regard as well, I do want to thank you for a massively successful conference um, and also thank you for the role that SIOSH is playing with regards to all of the stakeholders that we interviewed. Uh, we spoke with almost all of the speakers and everybody has had only good things to say with regards to how SIOSH assists in the industry. So with that, uh, from our side at My Safety Hub, thank you. Thank you. I, I see our role as more just than registering professionals, mm -hmm. as to give back and to actually make the profession of health and safety to stand out and be accepted just like any other profession. Thank you.